हेलो एवरी वन वेलकम बैक टू फंडामेंटल्स ऑफ नैनो एंड क्वांटम फोटोनिक्स सो दिस इज द फिफ्थ वीक ऑफ द कोर्स सो फार वी हैव सीन द बेसिक इंट्रोडक्शन टू इलेक्ट्रो मैग्नेटिक वेव्स एंड वी टॉक्ड अबाउट द ऑप्टिकल प्रॉपर्टीज ऑफ मेटल्स एंड डायलेक्ट्रिक्स एंड देन ऑल्सो वेंट इन टू सम डिटेल अबाउट ऑप्टिकल प्रॉपर्टीज ऑफ क्वांटम कन्फाइन नैनो स्ट्रक्चर्स एंड देन वी स्टार्टेड इंट्रोड्यूसिंग वॉट हैपन्स वैन uh light interacts with metal nano structures so that was the last week plasmonics we talked about it in uh, i think some detail so this week i want to talk about how electromagnetic wave interacts with periodic structures that's the agenda all right before i go into that topic i just wanted to quickly show you what happens when light interacts with dielectric nanospheres or nanoparticles because last week we have talked about the plasmonic structures that means you know metal nanoparticles and this is something that i just wanted to tie it up so i will take 5 minutes to talk about this all right so uh, we've already seen what happens when light is incident on a metal nanoparticle we said uh, you will have this sort of a charge distribution right uh, the uh, and then there's of course a cos theta term here right this is going to be cos theta term and then what we said was when the metal dielectric constant epsilon 1 uh, the real part is twice the surrounding medium's uh, epsilon then you have a resonant excitation and then you have a large charge density that accumulates at the ends like a dipole so that's why we see i mean we have shown a different version of this picture on the top wherein we say that okay this red is essentially positive and negative and if you look at it in time or you know a different instance how the wave propagates you will see that this charge density is oscillating and then you end up getting opposite polarity minus plus and then gradually varies back and forth this way this is the resonant behavior we have talked about and we also said that okay this is going to the the charge oscillation is going to be out of phase now what happens when you have light incident on a dielectric nanoparticle in case of metal the field inside has to be zero because it has lots of Uh, free carriers right the carriers have to readjust so that the field is zero but in the case of dielectrics that need not happen so in effect what happens is in the dielectric nanoparticle you will have some residual field inside the, let's say if i take my a spherical particle like this and then i subject it to some sort of a electric field in this way right in this direction there is some field incident electromagnetic wave rather is incident what happens well in this case uh, if you assume that there is the direct the nanoparticle is put in a constant field that's a quasi static approximation we made right even if you take that what will happen is in the case of a dielectric nanoparticle there is going to be some polarization inside and that is not going to be zero it's going to be uniform actually all right and then there is this incident field and then there is this uh, polarization which is a response and at certain wavelengths you can have a resonant response response here as well okay but it is still not the same type of resonance as you know what we talked about where you know the denominator is going to zero in this case because the balance in the forces you will have some charge accumulation at the edges and you can excite certain modes and typically in literature we call them as me resonances and because me theory explains these things very well all right so essentially you have the external field and then there is this internal field and then there is you know let's say there will be again Uh, dipole resonance of this fashion and so on all that will happen okay but in uh, uniquely in the case of uh, dielectric nano structures you find that if i try to look at the charge densities that uh, that appear on the sphere they are much much smaller the bottom picture here shows you the charge density for a dielectric structure but in this case the charge density has been multiplied by 200 times so that it's visible so you see that compared to a metal nanoparticle the amount of charge density that accumulates at the on the nanoparticle in response to an incident field is much much smaller and also because this is a dielectric there is no phase shift in this case all right so this is how a dielectric nanoparticle responds and we can analyze this you know we, we can use the same me theory that we talked about in the last uh, video of the week i showed you the demo small demo of how you can calculate the modes right in the case of a metal uh, structure it was like electric dipole and quadrupole nothing much was happening the magnetic uh, resonances are fairly weak in nano structures all right but in the case of sphere you can have 
more richer variety of resonances so that uh, the results of you know how the scattering efficiency looks like as a function of uh, wavelength for a silicon sphere of diameter 200 nanometers is shown here what you find is here you know you have the typical you know extinction scattering and absorption cross sections we can calculate and remember this is efficiency i think in the previous week i showed you the the cross section itself so the efficiency essentially means the scattering cross section efficiency is going to be scattering cross section divided by the area okay area of the sphere uh, the cross section area so pi r square r is the radius so that's how you get the efficiency so if you compute that this is what you get so it's basically you know you have much stronger scattering efficiency compared to a, you know the regular without any if you take a plain cross section of the sphere it's much much stronger than that so definitely it's an efficient scatterer and it has various modes and these modes can be decomposed into what we mentioned as a and b coefficients last week in the end i mentioned it's just additional thing but this effectively turns out to be what is called as magnetic dipole md i'll call it and then there is this electric dipole and then there is this uh, magnet magnetic dipole electric dipole and then electric quadrupole is very weak here eq peak and there is a magnetic uh, quadrupole mq right so there are these things that come into the spectrum that's why the spectrum is much more richer and you can also calculate you know I, of course i didn't put this part of the code online but uh, you can in principle use the same code and extend it further to calculate the fields in the nanoparticle and you see that if you take a silicon nanoparticle at these resonances you have a characteristic dipole kind of a resonance quadrupole electric fields and then these two are for the magnetic dipole and quadrupole now the magnetic dipole has a perpendicular orientation in this case the magnetic dipole is actually oriented this way so what you see is a uh, the cut donut shape all right and then you have the quadrupole where the fields are confined into the nanoparticle rather than just outside here as you saw so there are some variations we need not worry about it what essentially you know you need to know is let's say the magnetic dipole the magnetic dipole effectively is uh, dependent on the diameter of the particle if you increase the diameter let's say uh, if i talk of lambda md magnetic dipole that's going to be proportional to the the diameter so as the circumference increases it, the dipole resonance also shifts and then there is also this refractive index uh, term that comes in all right so typically if i take 200 nanometer uh, particle i think it turns out to be about so 800 7 just below 800 for silicon the magnetic dipole all right so uh, you can estimate these things and this is something that uh, i just wanted to do uh, review this for the sake of completeness we will anyway when we talk about the meta surfaces we will actually come back to it but because we discussed the metal nanoparticles i just wanted to show that even in the case of dielectric nanoparticles you will have some effects all right so uh, with that i'll come back to what i was planning for this week that is essentially uh, the electromagnetic response of a multilayer stack so now uh, the question we want to ask is how do we understand when electromagnetic wave is incident on a layers you know multiple a stack containing multiple layers let's say this is n1 so maybe i'll write it in blue you have n1 n2 n1 n2 and so on you have multiple layers i mean it can even extend many more layers okay so effectively you have let's say some uh, periodicity d okay and then maybe there is some thickness okay so basically you put many many bilayers and you get thicker uh, substrates okay so now how does the response depend what does response depend on when you have such a structure so the response will depend on what is the dimensions d the periodicity right how much is it okay so in effect what happens is the response depends on basically comparison of d with respect to lambda how much is it d is the periodicity right so for example first case you can have a situation wherein the d the thickness is much much greater than the lambda of the electromagnetic wave incident or you can have a situation where the d is comparable to the wavelength or you can have a situation where d is much much smaller than lambda these are the three typical you know scenarios you can think of okay so now 
when the thickness of the slabs you know basically you have one slab and another slab in this way right and there is some thickness overall periodicity is d so in the first case the thickness is much much bigger so you don't have to really worry about it and you can describe this using what i'll call as uh, traditional ray optics all right so you take the beam and then you propagate a certain distance and take a reflection coefficient and so on typically that works like what you use in lenses how does a lens lens focus electromagnetic energy onto my retina right essentially it's ray optics okay now when the d becomes comparable to lambda then we'll have to resort to what is known as full what are known as full wave simulations so now what we say is it is not enough just to look at the distances but you also have to look at the fields the reason is the electromagnetic wave propagates and then they can add they they'll be a reflected wave and they can add in phase and so on and then it becomes uh, much more richer physics so for that you have to actually compute using uh, let's say maxwell solvers all right the third extreme or the, the extreme case of d is much much smaller than lambda i can represent it by what is known as i can use what is known as an effective medium effective medium what do i mean by that let's say i have my uh, structure which is shown here i can think of this entire structure as one particular slab you know let's say in this case maybe i'll say this structure i'll represent it as a slab of this fashion so i'll say this is equivalent this particular sex set thing is equivalent sorry this is looking weird so i'll say this is equivalent okay <laughs> well okay so why is it equivalent when is it equivalent i'll say no no i can represent this entire stack as an anisotropic effective medium what do you mean by effective medium well i'm saying that the entire stack is going to be equivalent to let's say this is my thickness t i'll say this i'll forget about the the periodicities and all that i'll simply represent by an effective permittivity let's say in this case i mean okay you can even i mean mu is anyway uh, one let's assume so root of uh, permittivity is refractive index so i'll say that this is going to be represented by let's say an epsilon effective in the perpendicular direction and epsilon effective in the parallel direction the reason i'm saying is you i mean of course this is not strictly required here the difference is going to be small but if you take metal and dielectric structures which we'll consider later we'll see that there's going to be a significant difference between these two all right so now i'm representing my uh, medium as this two permittivities so now uh, the per the response is no longer linear but you have to represent it using a tensor so it depends whether the electric field is going to be let's say if this is my uh, z axis and this is my x and this is my y and z so in the z axis is going to be different and then the x and y axis is going to be different right so the electromagnetic wave is incident with a polarization in the xy plane that the response is different from when the polarization is in the z direction all right so that's what happens you can represent so this is the in a way we can simplify a lot of structural detail using this effective medium there are some effective medium theories that people have developed and uh, if time permits we'll take a look at them at some point okay or in some uh, briefly i'll mention it and i'll refer you to the textbook that has some more detail all right so now so what well i want to draw your attention to one fact that is we are all familiar with what happens in semiconductors you now most of us study them it's it's a heart of electronic devices so in a semiconductor what you have is essentially let's say silicon atoms which are arranged in a lattice when you arrange silicon atoms in a lattice and then there is this potential that it can be associated with each atom right and then i can talk of this potential and this is exactly what is known as chronic penny model in the literature so you can talk of a pot uh, potential like this and then that can be represented as a you know square rectangular potential wells series of rectangular potential wells and then you can talk of how the electron propagates in that all right now how does the electron propagate well the response of the electron is the way the electron propagates is going to be dependent on how much is the de broglie wavelength okay let's say i have my i'll represent my electron by a wave and i'll say there is a de broglie wavelength d 
probably d db maybe i'll call it that is effectively lambda by <laughs> sorry not lambda h by p so if the momentum of the electron is large then i have a very small de broglie wavelength and then i have to really think of how the scattering happens with each potential well okay a lot of quantum effects come into picture but if my energy of the electron is large then i will simply ignore all the band everything and then i'll simply say there is a conductivity that's it i'll deal with it as an effective piece of silicon with a conductivity that's it i don't need to care about everything if the wavelength is comparable to the periodicities in this case you know the lattice constant is going to be maybe something like 3 angstroms if in that range you have so effectively we can talk of bands we introduce bands and then we say no no the electron is now not going to move as if it's free electron but it's going to move as if it is uh, propagating with effective uh, mass and you know it can drift and so on so we have the band theory that explains all that so similarly we can essentially the wave propagation the photon or electromagnetic wave propagation in a periodic structure like this is it has a lot of parallels okay just like you have certain energies where you know semiconductor cannot let an electron propagate the band gap you will have band gaps even in this case okay there are a lot of analogies the schrodinger equation is a two, uh, second order differential equation in space and you know first order in time right but uh, similarly a wave equation is second order partial differential equation in space and time actually there is some differences the dispersion is different the energies are different but still there are a lot of parallels between how an electron behaves in a solid in a semiconductor compared to how a photon behaves in a multilayer stack so there's a lot of interesting things we can study that probably are difficult to study in uh, electronics because the length scales are much larger in the case of photonics all right so that's why these structures are important so now how do we understand the electromagnetic response okay to understand the electromagnetic response i need to look at uh, let me take a simplified example i'll say i'll consider an electromagnetic wave which is incident on a on a on a slab let's say okay of refractive index let's say n2 so how my slab and then which is let's say of thickness d i've already put the axis so this is my thickness d and an electromagnetic wave is incident on this from the left this is my exponential uh, i'll say in this case i omega t minus kx okay just note this difference so far in the previous weeks i have been talking of exponential minus i omega t and then so it was exponential i kx minus omega t right that's the notation we were using i said that okay both are valid notations the only thing is the way you represent refractive index has to be taken care we we talked about it we also gave you some assignments on uh, homework uh, questions on this so you should be familiar the reason is i just wanted to you know i wanted to highlight the fact that you know different books use different notations so this particular notation i am taking from uh, this discussion today on the how the response happens in multilayer structures i have taken from pochi ace book on uh, waves in layered media and he uses this notation so i am just maintaining consistency with the textbook all right so i have this wave incident so but it doesn't it shouldn't matter you just have to follow a consistent uh, notation that's it okay some software use plus i omega t notation some software use minus i omega t notation so all that is common so you'll have to take care, you have to know that okay so now this wave is incident so what happens the first thing that you can think of is since it's a slab it has a different you know refractive index so this is let's say n2 refractive index and this is my n1 and this is n3 it's just for generality okay so now if you have such a scenario the first thing that's going to happen is the electromagnetic wave is going to reflect some of it is going to reflect right how does the reflection happen well because there is an impedance mismatch there is reflection so what i can do is i can write out electromagnetic wave in each of these sections there are three particular layers in this i can think of that way and then i'll write out the electromagnetic wave ex like the electric field variation as a function of x there are three different things so in the first part which is d less than 0 d for d less than 0 okay maybe i'll write it and then okay yeah so i'll write it as a exponential i'll drop the i omega t k1 x x plus b exponential i k1 x x so what i'm saying is i dropped the i omega t notation and i said there is this wave which is propagating in the positive x direction and there's a reflection because of that there is going to be a reflected wave which is going to be in the negative x direction here and you see that there is a different coefficient and you know, we can assign it right now this is just a notation right so i i will say that this is electric field for x less than d you can have also an electric field for x between 0 and d what will happen 
Well, this is going to be some wave, again the same form. So, there is going to be C exponential minus I k 2 x x plus D exponential I k 2 x x. This is for x between 0 and, I am sorry, in the first case, it should be not D, it should be x less than 0. Okay? This is between 0 and D. <coughs> so, and then in the third case, for x greater than d, you will have another field. I will say that is E exponential minus i k 3 x x. But in this case, it is a semi infinite medium, there is no reflection, so I will not put the reflection part. All right? So, this is my electric field. And then what is the K1, K2, K3? Well, K3, K1, X, K2, X are essentially the K1, X, K2, X and K3, X are the propagation, the, the wave vectors. Okay? The X component of the wave vectors actually. Wave vectors in each medium, right? The corresponding medium. Right. So, if you have this, how does this help us? Well, the traditional way of solving this is equate the coefficients. So, we understand the boundary conditions. We know that the parallel component of the uh, wave vector has to be continuous, perpendicular, there is going to be difference in refractive index, right? We have studied that. So, now what happens is we can apply the boundary conditions and determine these coefficients, okay? So, we can do essentially determine A, B, C, D, E using boundary conditions. But, you know, I mean, once you know that, you can compute what is transmission coefficient, reflection coefficient. For example, in this case, since we are talking about a, a slab like this, the reflection coefficient is going to be the ratio of B divided by A, the coefficient, the amplitude, if you take the reflected wave and then uh, incident wave, the ratio is going to be the uh, reflection coefficient. And then I can also think of a transmission coefficient, which is going to be E by A. You can have these coefficients. All right. I, I really, you know, don't want to go into how exactly this happens. The reason being, what if I have two more layers? Then we'll write out the fields in each of them and try to put boundary conditions in each of them. It becomes a little tedious for us to do. All right. So I'll try to introduce an alternative way of handling this, and uh, that is what is known as transfer matrix approach. Okay. The way we do that is, let's say you have the same problem. Okay. And what I'll do is I'll, I'll just make a small change in the notation. I'll say that my electric field E of X, I can write it as basically there is a right propagating wave. Okay. I mean, I can put, let's say, okay, just to not confuse the notation, I'll simply change it to R exponential I K X. Okay. So it's going to the right direction plus it's going to the left direction exponential I K X. Okay, so I'll say that there are two waves that are possible in, in a particular layer. Okay, what I'll do is I'll say this is going to be equivalent to simply ax plus bx. Okay, so I'm introducing a coefficient a and b essentially, which is going to be uh, sorry a, a, a parameter a and b, which is going to be a function of x. The electric field is essentially sum of both. That's it. You know, we simplified it to our, to make our analysis tractable. All right. So now. Clearly, when you have a wave incident on a particular medium, let's say consider this interface at z equal to or x equal to 0, the electric field on both sides is going to be different, isn't it? Because, I mean, it depends on, of course, the, the direction of uh, the wave vector and all that. But even then, I mean, in general, we can assume it to be different. Okay. So now, what happens if you have different uh, coefficients? So what I'll do is I'll say that I, I'll represent my uh, amplitude on the left by, let's say, <coughs> A1, B1, okay, left of the interface. And on the right of the interface, now I'm talking about the second medium. So I'll say this is my A2 prime and B2 prime, okay. So what I'm doing is essentially, I'm trying to define, let's say I'll call my A of X equal to zero minus, just to the left of A, I'll represent it by A1 and B1 x equal to 0 minus just to the left, I'm calling it as b1. Whereas a at x equal to 0 plus, just next to the interface, I'll call it as a2 prime 
and a of x uh, is equal to 0 plus sorry b of x equal to 0 plus i'll call it as b2 prime okay the same thing i can do at the second interface the next interface okay so i'm trying to generalize so now a at d instead of x equal to i'm simply a of d minus i'll represent it as a2 and b of d minus i'll represent it by b2 and a at uh, d plus i'll represent it by a3 prime b of d plus i'll represent it by b3 prime <coughs> so what i'm doing is simply on the left of interface in this case a2 b2 right of interface a3 prime b3 prime all right i have done this now how does this help us well I mean, if you actually do the entire analysis and all that, you will discover that I can establish, I can relate these coefficients across the interface. For example, if I look at, let's say, my coefficient a1, b1, I'll represent it by column vector. And it turns out that that is going to be equal to d1 inverse d2. a2 inverse a2 prime b2 prime. What I'm saying is, if I have this interface, the coefficients across the interface are defined by d1 inverse d2. And what are these? These are essentially 2 by 2 matrices. These things, d alpha is a 2 by 2 matrix. Okay. And what exactly is this matrix? Well, I mean, uh, you can actually go back and look at the book that I mentioned in the bottom here, Pochi's book. It turns out that d alpha, I can say it is going to be n alpha cos theta alpha, n alpha cos theta alpha. This is going to be 1 and 1, n alpha cos theta alpha minus this. If I have my incident uh, wave to be S polarized or a TE wave, S polarized means if you have a wave incident on an interface, you have the plane containing the incident wave, reflected wave and the surface normal. That is called the plane of incidence. If the electric field is perpendicular to that, it is called as T or S polarization. And similarly, if I have uh, P polarization, in this case, my cos theta alpha is going to be there, 1 and minus 1. And this is going to be my matrix for P polarization. So essentially, alpha is representing the layer. So if I have layer 1, layer 2, the interface between layer 1 and layer 2 is given by these matrices. So if I have S polarization, I know my in angle of incidence, okay? So theta alpha in each layer, theta alpha in each layer is, is can be determined, right? Can be determined using Snell's law. So what I'll do is, you know, in the assignment, I'll just give you three, a stack of three, la three layers. I'll say refractive index 1, 2, 3, some, you know, 1, 1 1.5, and let's say 2. And then I'll give a theta alpha incident. So you can calculate what is theta alpha in the second medium and the third medium using Snell's law. Okay. It turns out that, I mean, there is a very simple relation between, you don't need to keep calculating. Let's say five, five structures are there. There's a very simple relation. If you just work it out, you'll see that if you know the incident and the outside, the medium where it's exiting, there'll be a simple relation to calculate the theta. Okay. So you can find, find out this. Once you know that, you can simply write a two by two matrix. You can do it in MATLAB, Python, whatever you want, right? Once you do that, you have the electromagnetic, uh, the way it's, uh, the, the propagation is happening, all right? So once I do this, what I can do is, let's say now I found out this. This interface, what is a jump? The second interface, what is a jump, right? I did that. So now if I do this, I can think of, you know, uh, okay, let me again, you know, do this. A, this is going to be A1, B1, A2 prime, B2 prime. And then I have my A2 and B2, and then A3 prime, B3 prime, okay? So I have related the interface, but I didn't tell you what happens at the, in between. There's a layer of thickness D, right? Okay, how does the wave propagate? Sorry. through medium 
of thickness d how does that happen it turns out that that happens by i can denote that by a propagation matrix so what i'll say is let me say i have a2 prime b2 prime i'll take this as a uh, a and b coefficients and they are related by related to let's say across the slab so a2 and b2 they're going to be related by what is known as a propagation matrix and what is this propagation matrix in general this is p2 i should call it because it's the second medium so p alpha is going to be simply exponential i k alpha x uh, sorry not x this i know that the thickness d so 0 0 exponential minus i k alpha d what is this telling you so if you look at let's say for example a2 prime if you just substitute the matrix and see a2 prime is simply exponential i k 2 d times a2 well it's simply the phase phase term so the field on the right is going to be uh, multiplied by a phase term so that's how the phase is changing that's it that's all this propagation matrix implies all right so now why does this help us okay so yeah i mean this is my additional additional phase term okay how does this help us well it helps us because i can start with the left and then i can try to see what happens a1 b1 if i have and that is going to be equal to d1 inverse d2 a2 prime b2 prime right but i know what is my a2 prime and b2 prime in terms of a2 and b2 so this is going to be d1 inverse d2 p2 a2 b2 right the propagation matrix now across the interface again i can apply these matrices so i can do d1 inverse d2 p2 d2 inverse i think and d3 in terms of a3 prime b3 prime so this is what i have so essentially what i'm saying is if i have my layered stack i can re i can relate the fields by just using a, a matrix a product of matrices essentially all these d and p's are matrices two by two matrices so this entire thing i'll call it as transfer matrix transfer matrix relating fields across a slab okay now this technique it might seem simple why do you have to go through all this lens i can even actually if i open a textbook i'll find the analytical formula to calculate my transposition reflection but it turns out that if you have more such structures let's say layers let's say instead of just this i'll say a0 I mean, because okay, now I'm just putting multi layer, so A zero, B zero, and then A one, A zero prime is it? What do I might? Okay, yeah, A, let me go back. Okay, right is prime, so A one prime, B one prime, A two, B two, and so on. It goes on till here. It becomes A n, B n, and then this becomes A s prime, B s prime. So basically, this is superstrate and substrate. Yeah, when you can just denote what you want. All right. So now, if I have such a structure, any number of structures, I don't care. Okay, the n can be anything in this case. So now, how will I relate my fields? It turns out that, let's say, I have my a zero, b zero. I'll start from the left. A zero to b zero. That is going to be equal to first step. This is going to be d zero. This is going to be a d zero inverse. And then there's going to be a D1. And then there's a propagation P1. And then there's going to be D1 inverse D2. Propagation P2. D2 inverse. And then there's going to be D3. Yeah, inverse D2 inverse. Yeah, across the interface 2 to 3. And then there's going to be P3. And then there's going to be D3 inverse. And so on. Till you get basically uh, what? d n p n d n inverse 
ds and then finally i'll relate it to as prime bs prime this is what i'm doing okay so essentially i'm expanding this entire thing you know why is this useful well you see a uh, trend now so you have for each layer effectively you have this product of three matrices d1 p1 d1 inverse d2 p2 d2 inverse d3 p3 d3 inverse and so on so effectively irrespective of how many numbers i can write it as d0 inverse and then i'll represent it by a product of d alpha p alpha d alpha inverse i'll do a product of these matrices for each layer so l is going to become 1 to let's say n there are n layers so l equal to 1 to n over these layers i'll simply write a product of matrices and then ds and then there's going to be as prime bs prime all right so this is going to be my uh, matrix the reason this is interesting is now i can simply talk of let's say this particular thing entirely product okay even include ds and d0 so this is essentially a 2 by 2 matrix m11 m12 m21 m22 so this is my transfer matrix relating fields on left to right fields on the right so essentially as a wave propagates left to right it will relate the field fields that's it it is somewhat similar to scattering matrices which relate input to outputs okay you can actually convert from transfer matrix to scattering matrix and back and forth but it turns out that if you have a wave propagation it's easier to think of transfer matrices okay so once we have this we can talk of let's say uh, the reflection coefficient uh, r so reflection coefficient is going to be simply the amplitude b not divided by a not b not by a not okay and of course in the end we are assuming that this is a infinite medium so i'll say that semi infinite in the end substrate so this is going to be bs is going to be zero because it's there's no reflection from the eventually in the end okay it's a semi infinite so we don't care so now this is the ratio of this one okay and it turns out that this reflection coefficient is going to be dependent on simply m21 divided by m11 that's it so if i know my transfer matrix which i can compute using just a loop i can write a for loop put layer 1 to layer n and each layer i calculate this matrices and just it you calculate this and you have the reflection coefficient and similarly the transmission coefficient i can compute let's say as prime is the transmission divided by a not right this is my transmission and this is going to be simply equal to 1 over m11 so if i know my matrix transfer matrix by looking at which element you know your by taking a ratio of the m21 and m11 element i know the reflection coefficient and 1 over m11 is my transmission coefficient all right so these are what are known as field reflection coefficients we can even write in terms of amplitude reflection coefficients which are uh, you know let's say reflection amplitude reflection is going to be field square and that is simply going to be m21 divided by m11 square and similarly for transmission you can write it in terms of the field transmission coefficient square but because there is a substrate this is a small correction we have to do so there is a substrate s ns cos theta s divided by n not cos theta not and then theta not and then 1 over m11 square so these are these are my coefficients these are my amplitude reflection coefficient all right so that's how that's how powerful this t matrix is okay so i'll quickly take a little bit of time to try to give you a couple of examples now we will actually put this code in the nqp public uh, github folder so i remember i mentioned in the end of last week that you know we have this repository created on github so we'll put this t matrix code on github you please download and then look at it it'll be interesting for you so uh, what essentially we said was this is very useful you know you can look at multiple things so a couple of examples i want to highlight for example this is an example calculation of reflection and transmission 
for a stack containing you know there is superstrate and there's a substrate let's say glass and between there are three different uh, refractive in- layers of three different layers of different uh, refractive indices they are chosen in such a way that the optical path is essentially constant you know or the first one is uh, quarter wavelength second one is half wavelength and the f- third one is quarter wavelength again so if you have a stack of these three so essentially what you have is a substrate and then there is in this case 1.63 which has an optical path of 0.25 and then there is a thickness thicker material of you know let's say 2.2 index optical path of point uh, this is 0.25 0.25, 0.5, and then 0.25, and then air. So this is the stack I have. Sorry, this one I should not write it as 0.25. I'll write it as 1.1 point. The refractive index here is 1.38. So if I have such a structure, okay, I can define what is known as optical path. Optical path length is equal to the refractive index n times the physical thickness. So in this expression, we have to give the physical thickness. So basically, optical path length of point to point to five quarter wave layer, quarter wave layer, divided by the refractive index. Physically, that's going to be the physical thickness, physical thickness, physical thickness. Three different thicknesses. You put in the numbers and calculate the reflection. It turns out uh, so beautifully that the transmission is essentially one, almost one, and then there is no uh, sorry that reflection. So dash is transmission. Yeah, transmission is one. Reflection is almost zero. So this is surprising. The reason being, if I take simply air and glass, air. And there is a glass here, air glass interface. I can easily compute my refract uh, reflection coefficient. That is going to be n one minus n two divided by n one plus n two whole square. And for air and glass, this is one. This is one point five. This will turn out to be roughly four percent. But by using a certain stack of materials, intelligently designed, of course, there is some theory to it, and you can calculate these expressions are available. I don't want to go into all that. It's a standard thing in the anti-reflection coating community. You will any book you take, you will find descriptions on this. But effectively, you see that instead of having a four percent reflection, I have negligible reflection. All right, and by choosing the number of layers, I can actually go lower and lower. I can actually show that you know it can be even smaller than you know one percent or you know point five percent and so on. I can I can design whatever I need. That's the power, you know. If you have a simple material, you would not be able to do it. But by designing alternative layers of these things, we are able to do. So, just another example. So, basically, if I have, let's say, you know, this is basically some films which are deposited on top of a prism. There are there is one prism. There are some films deposited. There is another prism. So, in such a structure, what happens is, in this case, there is refractive index of, I think, high and low again. So, I'll call it NHS two point three. I'm just looking up the numbers. NL is one point two five. So, this example I have taken by from a book. By Orphanides, okay. I think it's called EM waves. I'm sorry, I should have put the reference here. And antennas by Sophocles Orphanides, I think. Orphanides, Orphanides. Okay, this is a freely available book. If you look at chapter eight, you will find lot of examples. Okay, I picked up these examples from there. And then we applied our code to simply run it and validate. So what happens is, if you have such a structure. I have, let's say, uh, electro uh, unpolarized wave which is incident from the left side at an angle of 45. Now, what you will see is the p-polarized wave will transmit and the s-polarized wave will reflect. So that's the issue. over the range of 400 to 700 uh, nanometer wavelengths. You see that the s-polarized wave is completely reflecting, whereas the p-polarized wave is almost, you know, not reflecting at all. So it's transmitting. So you are able to use, create a polarizer out of it, just using a few layers. Okay, of uh, different refractive indices like this. All right. Similarly, I can even create structures. In this case, I think it's slightly more complicated structure from the same book. So in this case, I think the NH, the high refractive index high was two point three two, and NL was one point three eight, and then the optical path lengths were I think quarter wave path point two five point two five, and then there were n equal to thirty layers. So a lot of layers stacked up on, and then you see that if you create such a thing. You actually, as you increase the number of layers, you know this transition here from you know this there is this path where it's reflecting, and then it's sharply going to zero. Here, in this case, there is a slightly gradual transmission. Uh, ref- uh, sorry, this is a reflection change. But if you create multiple layers, I can try to engineer that you have a very very sharp edge. Okay, so essentially, what's going to happen is the response is again going to be dependent on the angle. 
so if you come at zero there is some ang- uh, some window wherein the wave is getting reflected if you come at some other angle your wave is shifted the, the response is shifted so effectively what is happening here you can think of it like a band gap okay so you're creating a photonic band gap so if you have a material like this let's say some block of some structure of this thicknesses and all that a wave is incident in certain energy it's complete it's not getting transmitted it's getting entirely reflected why is it getting reflected because there is there exists a band gap okay so the the structure behaves as if there is a band gap all right so this is a very very interesting concept of how band gaps occur so uh we will actually in in the next lecture i'll talk about photonic band gaps and so on but i just wanted to introduce this a uh, basic idea this t matrix which is very very useful because you know in nanophotonics a lot of times we run simulations using sophisticated tools and it turns out that if you know these uh uh techniques you can validate whether the simulations are correct so routinely when i have my phd students i ask them to validate some simple examples so that the simulation setup is right all right so for that purpose this t matrix helps a lot this is analytic calculations and you know you can trust it okay and so that's how it's useful and that's why i wanted to discuss and in the next week i'll you know this also tries to you know uh, you can get an idea of why the ba- i mean so i told talk, talk, talked about the analogy between electronics and the photonics just like electronics you have band gaps you have photonic band gaps and we will talk a lot more detail about it in the next lecture all right so with that i would like to stop this lecture now and i'll meet you in the next uh, lecture